There we go. Fantastic. Well, good morning and um, good morning here in Australia. I'm talking to my friend uh, Gaetano Morello, who's in Boston in the US. And uh, he's been a friend of mine for about a year now and has got a great specialty in a, in a love of mine and my, uh, my career passion has been around property development. He's a property developer and uh, doing it at a very high level. So we wanted to have a chat about that. So thanks for coming along. Thanks for having me, Dave. It's good to be here. My, my pleasure, yeah. Yeah, he, uh, you're a man who's um, doing some interesting things, not just in your property projects, but um, we were just talking about the, the you were reshooting a reel, and I'd like to get into that about this new project you're uh, doing. But And I was asking, just off camera there, I was just asking, um, you know, what, what makes you tick? Because you've got a pretty succinct tagline and vision line now about what you're on about, and that that's touching property, but it's also touching the leadership work you're doing. So I'd love to hear more about that. So over to you. Give yourself a good rap and a good intro. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks, Dave. So yeah, I think the my two passions right now have really been um, real estate and then building teams and working with teams and leadership. So the tagline that Dave is talking about is this vision statement that I have. And you know, my vision statement is to lead and build teams of entrepreneurs committed to enriching their lives and unleashing their greatness to the world. So that's my vision statement, it's something I'm very passionate about. Um, I've recently started uh, a company called Level Up, which executes that vision specifically. It's bringing entrepreneurs together to support one another to reach their goals. So I think we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later, but um, just a little bit of background on, on me and, and real estate. Um, I grew up in a real estate family. I've been around it my entire life. Um, I started you know, sweeping the floors of apartments and painting fences um, at my father's property when I was like 14 in the summers. Um, so he started me at a, a really young age. Um, and I think I really got a passion for it when I was 18. I got my, my real estate license. And it was at that time I was uh, studying at Boston University and I realized I could use that license to rent all my friends' apartments. So I actually ended up renting all the frat houses on campus and everyone was kind of going to me to, to get their apartments. So I got the bug for brokerage and kind of that entrepreneurial drive with real estate, um, graduated BU with um, a degree in finance and entrepreneurship. And after BU, I, um, I worked for the family office, High Street Properties for a couple of years where I did condo conversions in some of the um, markets just outside of Boston. Mm. Um, after that, I went to New York City to get my master's degree in real estate development Mm. And it was while I was studying in New York that I worked for the number one team at Sotheby's in Manhattan. Mm. Um, I actually secured a $12.5 million listing my first year there, which uh, at the ripe age of 23 wow. was a pretty incredible experience. Um, and I'm blessed to have experienced that. Um, but I knew brokerage long term wasn't for me. Um, my mm. passion was really in building and um, creating and designing spaces. So naturally I, I gravitated to hotel right out of grad school. I worked for a hotel developer for a while. I worked for a retail investor in Brooklyn um, before moving back here to Boston four years ago to work for High Street Properties. Again, with all this knowledge after going to grad school, I was coming back to the family business and over the past four years, I've kind of found my niche here in Boston, which is buying historic brownstones and mm. converting them to luxury condos. So I'm on my fourth project now. All have been, you know, thankfully very successful. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what's next. But uh, I think I add some value to you guys because I have experience in a lot of the different um, asset classes of real estate and also you know, brokerage development. Um, oh yeah, we also, we own and manage a multifamily portfolio. So I also do all the acquisitions for the apartment buildings that we buy and renovate and, and add value to. So wow. that's the, the full picture of my real estate career to date. 
Mm. That's exciting. Yeah, well, real estate's, um, particularly in the US, it's got so many different aspects to it. And what you're hitting on to me is exciting because it's an exciting field because would it be true to say, do you think that in some ways when you're creating a brownstone a redevelopment, um, then you, you're, it's almost like a blank canvas where in terms of the design, but also you can create something that's really unique and therefore the pricing can um, be, it's not fixed into a certain band. You could probably expand that and design that to suit, depending on location and, and finish, et cetera. That, that would be exciting because then you're out of the realm of competition where everyone's you know, cannibalizing each other at certain price points for a certain product. Is that how you feel about the creativity that you can put into those projects? Yeah, you know, I think that the brownstones here in Boston, it's, it's a really unique opportunity to deliver a product that nobody else can really deliver. So, mm. of course, you have the big developers here in Boston, like in the seaport, they're putting up these towers, which are beautiful. You know, they're all glass. But the one thing that they, they can't mimic is a building that was built in the mid 19th century. You know, mm -hmm. just the detail on the facades of these buildings and, mm -hmm. and you know, some of like the historic elements of these properties are just unmatched and can't be mm -hmm. really recreated today. So I think in a lot of ways, you know, I have an opportunity to compete with, with some of these new developments, but in a different way for a buyer who's looking for something that's truly one of a kind. Um, and yeah, I mean, we can definitely push the price per square foot on brownstones in um, the top neighborhoods in Boston, which is where I do my projects, which is Back Bay, Beacon Hill, South End. Um, you know, people are paying, you know, millions and millions of dollars for, for these homes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, it's amazing. You can do whatever you want for the design on the inside, but what's, yeah. you can't really touch the outside because right. there's so many... Um, historic commissions in Boston that want to preserve the integrity of, of the buildings. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I can imagine as someone enters that building, they're entering thinking, you know, maybe with a preconceived idea of how, what that the internal is going to look like. And you've got the opportunity to literally blow them away by doing um, features and, and just structure, but also finish, which is completely surprising. And, that would <laughs> a hidden camera would probably reveal some pretty amazing responses. Yeah, I think that's the best part, especially when developers go very, very modern in a traditional mm -hmm. brownstone, because, mm -hmm. you know, you're walking down the street and it's like, you feel like you're in the, you know, 1800s and then you open the door and it's just like glass and steel and like ceiling heights. And you're like, Whoa, where, where, where am I? You know? Yeah. So that's really cool. I, I love introducing like drama into, into these buildings. It's a lot. That's, that's great. The creativity is beautiful. I picked that up right from the start. You've got a palette there where you can create something that's truly unique and um, congratulations on getting into that field. It's uh, exciting. I want to come up and see it and get a tour. I've, I've, I've worked on various uh, projects where we re gutted complete buildings and you can create something that's beautiful, but never on a residential level, they're always commercial buildings. Would love to have you, you would love yeah. it here. So the Manship project that we're doing, the, the whole, the, the three tenants, if you like, behind that are community, inspiration, and then action. You know, I, uh, and I say this about Manship, is that, you know, all men, are, all men, all people, we're all traveling down a road. Sometimes we're traveling down with others. Sometimes we feel like we're traveling down this road by ourselves, And, there's many markers along the way, many challenges, and um, often guys, particularly, when we hit challenges, we can feel like we're all isolated. So we withdraw. We're, we're unlike women in that sense, where we can, oh, I'll work it out. I'll go into my cave and I'll work this out. And the reality is, when we hit difficulties, it's good to know that there's a community there. And actually, hey, we might be going through this for the first time, but it's not the first time a man has gone through these things. And so I wanted to build a community for a start, but then in areas of a guy's life where they're, where things aren't happening as they'd like to, and money is probably one of the biggest areas, let's be honest. I wanted to inter interview inspiring speakers in the field of property, which I'm very, very familiar with, and also the financial market. So you're my first speaker with regard to property. 
Um, and then the, the intention was bring inspiration during that podcast so a man can then take action. So if they're sitting there thinking, geez, you know, I'd love to get into property or I'd love to build a property investment portfolio or I'd love to actively be, be involved, I wanted to use this time for you to um, just talk about what you do, inspire and then action. Because I know that, and we can touch on this, but you, your Level Up program, um, you, you do have at times selective people there. But can you just explain about um, what it is within property, again, that um, offers opportunity for people to get in and really build their wealth? You know, do you need a pedigree in property? You said that you come from a family, a property background. Uh, is that essential? Is it, pro is it possible for someone to get started in property and be successful uh, without, a, without a start at all? without a, a starting uh, starting point. Yes, of course. I mean, you know, as I, you know, told you earlier, like I'm very blessed to have grown up in a, a real estate family. So, you know, I, I had a bit of a leg up, but I certainly have a lot of friends who have started from scratch and have become very successful. And I think what it really boils down to is real estate is a relationship business. So, I think the more you focus on your interpersonal skills and kind of how you show up and, you know, being somebody that people want to work with, you may not be the guy with the money who's taking down the projects, but if you have the right people skills, you're partnering with that guy. They're believing in you. And what you want to make sure is that, you know, when you do show up, you have at least some of the skills, um, to get you to get you moving. So mm -hmm. I always think that if you're thinking about getting into real estate, one of the best ways to start is through brokerage and getting your real estate license, because it's there where you're going to learn the neighborhoods. You're going to learn what things are renting for. You're going to learn the landlords, all the who are potential sellers of property. You're going to have access to MLS, so you're going to see all the properties that come on the market on a daily basis. And, you know, you're just going to, you know, like I said, when I was 18, I got the bug for deal making and that kind of entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial um, bug. So I, I think that brokerage is a great way in. And I think also timing is really important. I mean, you, you want to ride, you know, the market on, on an upswing. And you want to buy when, you know, properties are a bit depressed. I mean, we'll see what happens with coronavirus, but certainly uh, one could argue that there are some great opportunities to enter the real estate market going mm -hmm. forward, especially with commercial hotel um, and, you know, retail assets. So I think starting in brokerage is a great way to get in. I would also really encourage, you know, networking, you mentioned level up. So I created a, a real estate mastermind where, you know, we have some members who are making over a million dollars a year and in their forties and are seasoned real estate professionals. But we also have like, you know, some guys who are 22 and just cutting their teeth and starting out. And you put this, them in this forum in a network of professionals where they feel open and free to ask whatever questions they want and, and get support. And it's like, you know, they're skipping probably a year or two years of, of having to like, you know, make those connections on their own. Um, so I think that, you know, building a team around you and getting a support structure, maybe having a mentor um, is very important. And in terms of cash position, um, you know, get friendly with a, a, a mortgage broker or, you know, see what kind of programs are out there because I know that for first time home buyers, you know, you can get into, you know, a multifamily property for like 5% down. So, you know, if you have, you know, 10, $20,000 maybe saved up, you can take down a pretty sizable property. Um, you know, if you can increase the rents, you run with that for a couple of years, you can refinance, start moving your money into other properties. So, you know, the way my, my father started was just buying triple deckers, which is mm. another word for three family buildings. And, you know, they mm. were like a few, you know, hundred, two hundred thousand dollars um, dollars You know, that's the acquisition price. So it didn't take much equity to get in. 
Um, and, you know, he's just grown building by building. And, and, you know, now he has a very sizable portfolio, but, you know, you, you got to start somewhere and it's definitely possible to do it mm -hmm. on your own. Yeah. And you, you've touched on this, but particular, opportunities have arisen, do you believe, out of the coronavirus? Yes, yeah, so I think they're still to come. Um, I'm still seeing deals on the market where they're priced the same as they were in February, and they're not trading because I think that, you know, people right now, there's just too much uncertainty. Um, I'm not going to be paying the same prices that I was paying in February until I see how all of this shakes out. Um, but I think multifamily is, is pretty secure for the most part. I mean, all of our rent checks have come in. Um, you know, granted, we are in pretty good neighborhoods and, and you know, our tenants have, have pretty good jobs and all of that. But um, other asset classes, like I was just speaking to a, uh, someone who works for one of the largest hotel operators in the United States this afternoon. And she was telling me if there was ever a time to get in a hotel, you should start looking now. And in September, I think you're going to see a lot of these mid-size independent hotels um, get ready to sell. So I think that that's something I'm keeping my eye on because I've always wanted to do a hotel. Yeah, I remember you saying that some time ago. Mm. Mm. But I think it's aw it's awesome what you're doing with man shit, Dave, and and you know, inspiring these guys on, on those those pillars. I think it's it's really important work that you're doing, and I'm just happy to happy to be here and, and be part of it. Um, tell me, um, thank you for that. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, and it's great to. Um, I I'm finding that all, all men. I think, you know, we, when we get down to it, we realize that, um, that life's a, life's a travel down a road and, uh, it's good to do it with other guys. And it's, and, and the reality is that it's also good to, um, recognize that along the, <laughs> along that road, sometimes we need a hand, sometimes we can give a hand. And I think you and I, you know, we've been doing these various transformational trainings in the last 12 months. And I think that that I, I definitely see in you a man who is, becoming uh, you know more complete in the way that you are and in doing so you're looking for other opportunities to to lead but also to lift others up and to show the way and give you know give a, a sense of inclusion um and that's really that that community is so important uh, amongst guys we we kind of i think we're ho hopefully entering a time where men are realizing that hey it's okay to admit i haven't got it all together and in doing so we uh, huge opportunities open up, but we've got to we've got to um, you know ex accept that it's okay not to have everything together in our life. Yeah, I mean, I I can relate to that. I mean, uh, you know, oftentimes, you know, I think it's really important for for men to be vulnerable with each other. You know, I can come on here and tell you about all the successes I've had and 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 ramble on about the good things, but like, um, there's obviously times in my life where I've struggled, you know, really had some really tough times. And, you know, it's, it's because of those people in my life who were there for me and pulled me out of it that, you know, I bounced back. So, yeah, I mean, I'm a huge believer in, you know, being in contribution, being generous, because the way you show up for other people is how, you know, the world shows up for you. Um, so. And it all comes full, full circle. So vulnerability is, is very important. Um, and supporting others is something that fires me up and makes me really happy. Um, and that's something that I think I more recently discovered about myself. Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful that, that I did because it makes me a happier person. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uh, you know, property is a long game uh, and, one of the one of the things with property is, as a developer, you're putting yourself on the line, aren't you? You're, you're the last one to get paid. Everything's got to go right, or pretty much right, according to plan. So, has has the challenges that's come with COVID nineteen? Uh, I'm guessing that if you looked across the landscape, there'd be some real estate developers who are too thin, and maybe in a competitive market where they've gone to the wall already, or 
you know, may well go to the wall. How do you see uh, property being a long game and being able to protect yourself um, and you know, have, a, have a solid background for these projects so that you can weather these random things like whether it's a real estate downturn or whether it's a COVID-19 or something like that? Yeah, so I think that the, the best piece of advice that was ever given to me in real estate is that you make money on the buy. Mm. So it doesn't really matter so much what you're going to be able to sell the property for because obviously once COVID hits or this thing takes a grip, if it does, the prices are going to go down. So if you bought the property based on what it would sell for, you could be screwed, you know? So, but if you buy the property right and you buy it at a fair price in the beginning, it just gives you that flexibility where if the sales prices fluctuate quite a bit on the back end, you still have enough buffer. So I always, you know, location, I always try to, you know, buy property in great locations because as soon as there's a little dip or downturn, it's those tertiary markets where there might have been higher yield originally that get hit first. But mm -hmm. you know, the stronger core locations mm -hmm. tend to, to remain a bit more stable. Um, I always put in a lot of contingencies mm -hmm. uh, in my pro formas, a sales contingency, a hard cost contingency, a soft yeah. cost contingency, and I have a plan B. So if they don't sell as condos, I want to go for a lower end appliance package, cheaper mm -hmm. flooring, different kind of design so that I can then rent them out. Right. And uh, then I just, you know, kind of wait in the weeds, so to speak, rent it out, co hopefully cover the, the debt on the property until the market rebounds. So right. yeah, I, I look at all of this stuff before I, I pull the trigger, but buying the property right, you make the money on the buy. So does that mean that you uh, put in, you're trying to sell the property before you get to the final finishing stage where flooring's down and cabinetry's in, where you've still got the option to go cheaper on those fittings? Are you trying to get it away before then or are you just getting a sense of what's going on in the market and where it might end up? Yeah, you, you kind of have to, to get, a, get a sense and know what material you've already ordered and what you haven't. But I mean, even with everything going on with COVID right now, like I'm sticking the course and I'm, I'm not going to plan B because frankly, I, I think that my opinion is that my units are going to sell maybe for slightly less. Um, but I don't see, you know, I don't, I don't really feel like I need to course correct just yet. Yeah. But right. yeah, I mean, it, it depends on where you are in the construction process and also how you feel about the, the market going ahead. Mm. Yeah. So uh, one of the comments I made earlier was, you know, as the developer, you, you take on the risk yourself, don't you? You know, you're, you're risking many things. You're risking things like the market, for example. You're risking in your case, and this is what I'd like to hear your thoughts on. You can, do a, you can pencil up a project and, and estimate costs, but um, in doing brownstone renovations, I'm sure there's been many instances where you've discovered something impossible to know how to have anticipated that was going to come up do you just have to load up all those contingencies so much to cover everything and when you're doing that then then it starts to take the project maybe it's either you've got to buy it for a low price to make it work to when you take those bigger uh, amount of contingencies in the case which means that maybe you you miss the property because you're offering less than how do you is it a gut feel are you developing that over time or or do you That's a good question. That's a really good question. I think that like, you know, when you go for a property, you don't want to build in so much contingency that you absolutely like ruin the deal. You yep. know, like at some point you're going to have to pay a little bit more than you wanted to, or mm -hmm. take on a little bit more risk than, you know, you might be used to and mm -hmm. just jump in. And that's mm -hmm. one thing you know, about real estate development that I think a lot of people get uncomfortable with because yeah. at the end of the day, like, you know, it is a risk and you're not going to be able, if you're the guy penciling in every unforeseen yeah. contingency, you're not going to get the deal because someone's going to outbid you. So, um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I told you this story. I, I walked into into one of my properties and there was a literally a 30 foot sewer tank in the ground underneath my property that I had no idea was there. That was an $18,000 change order. I mean, I didn't account for that. Um, but you know, things come up and hopefully you can make it up in other places on the budget. But, um, yeah, you just end up making a smaller profit and mm. basically it. Cause I guess in some ways those unanticipated expenses that come up is a little bit the same as paying a little bit more for the property at the front end, isn't it? You know, it's, yeah. it's a cost, which it's like, eh, I didn't forecast it, but yeah, I'll pay it and it'll, it'll still work out. When, when those sorts of um, costs come up and if they get significant, how does the bank view that? Does the bank kind of look and think, God, this guy doesn't know what he's doing or does that compromise his overall profitability, which means that the margin of safety for the bank is reduced? How do you go explaining it to a realtor when, or to, a, a, to oh, your I funding? Did. Yeah, so when unforeseen change orders like that come up, I typically, you know, you don't really necessarily need to like fill the lender in on every single, you know, thing that comes up on site. So for instance, I already knew how much the bank was going to lend me in construction dollars. So, you know, if there, if there was a, a cost beyond what they were lending, I would just pay for it out of my own equity. Um, mm. and just like, let it be my problem and not the bank's problem. I try to make things as like least complicated for the lender as possible because mm -hmm. you know, that's one relationship that you really want to be very strong. So, you know, they'll lend you money on the next deal. So yeah, mm. those kind of things I fund out of pocket and, uh, mm. I use the bank's money for, you know, the, the stone, the appliances, you know, all that stuff. When, when you are selling higher end properties, uh, you're dealing with a limited number of buyers, most probably. You know, you, you're normally dealing, particularly if you're selling properties for, you know, in the, maybe in the millions or somewhere up that way, then those people, those buyers are normally shrewd, aren't they? They've, they've been around, it's not their first rodeo. Uh, do you find that the negotiating with that buyer is uh, more challenging or is it, does it come down to supply and demand? And if you've got the product, then you've got negotiating power because you know there's nothing that compares to it. Um, so I would, I always hire a really, really good real estate broker. I think that that's very important. I think real estate brokers actually get kind of a tough rep sometimes. You know, they make a ton of money. People are like, oh, all they did is open the door. You know, I, I completely disagree. I think having a really strong power broker representing your property who knows that neighborhood very well is super important. And they're going to be able to navigate that negotiating process. But mm -hmm. um, generally speaking, I've had, you know, buyers who were spending, you know, close to $3 million on a property. And it's been a complete cakewalk. They were super easy to deal with and no problems. And then I'll get, you know, like a younger buyer who's, you know, spending, you know, maybe like a million on a, a smaller unit and it's, he's a complete nightmare. So it's mm -hmm. like, it, it really just, I think it just depends on, on the buyer. You know, I, I don't know. I, I don't think it, you can make vast generalizations based mm -hmm. on the price point, but I think there's probably something to be said that when people are shelling out millions of dollars, they have a bit more of a discerning eye, but mm. yeah. So post COVID-19, post COVID do you think that the, the number of buyers at that, those levels are going to be reduced? Will it be more, will you have to be more negotiable, do you think, on, on sales prices? It's possible. I, I was a little bit freaked out until recently. So up until about two weeks ago, the market here in Boston or under a million and a half dollars was on fire. I have a ton of friends in, in brokerage and they were doing a ton of deals in that price point. I wasn't mm -hmm. seeing anything over $2 million come on or go under agreement. Over the last two weeks, that's been ramping up. And I'm optimistic that, you know, those are gonna move at the same values or maybe slightly lower. 
the brownstones, I think, are a bit more protected because there's just a limited supply of brownstone stock out there as compared to, you know, some of these luxury towers where they have to move, you know, you know, a lot of units, you know, they, they lose their negotiating power. But I also think that with COVID, you know, it hasn't really affected people with money that much. You know, I think people who had money still have money. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've even heard people say that once this is over, people who have money are going to be spending more than they ever have because they're mm -hmm. just going to go wild because they've been trapped in for so long. So get ready mm -hmm. for a lot of spending. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we'll see. So in, in the work you do and also the teams, you know, your, the projects you run, you're running as teams and you're really um, leading those. How do you approach that on a daily basis to get yourself in a good position physically, mentally, spiritually um, for the day ahead? and in dealing with those different challenges and different teams that you're involved with? Yeah, I, I love this question because yes. this is like something that I'm a huge believer in and, and that's daily habits and kind of like morning rituals. So get a really good night's sleep, get your eight hours in. I wake up, I, I, do, I stretch for like five minutes mm. and then I will meditate for mm. 10 to 15 minutes Mm. And then I will do gra a gratitude practice in my journal. Mm. I'll eat a really healthy breakfast, drink some water. If I have time, you know, I'll get some exercise in um, mm. either in the morning or, or when I get home from work. It's been great during quarantine because like I can, mm. I can work out um, in the morning. It's not like I have to be at the office really early. So my schedule is a little bit more flexible, but mm. Yeah, diet, exercise, meditation, gratitude, mindfulness, reading, journaling, like all that good stuff for your brain. Just it makes me on point. I'm less reactive with my team, more responsive. Um, yeah, it's all of those things are must musts for me. Mm. Do you have you found in the people you deal with, particularly the high performers, that they have something similar, similar practice? Yes, like all of them. They wake up super early, they meditate, they're very self-reflective, they're into mindfulness. I think mm -hmm. that, and it depends what you mean by successful. When I mm -hmm. think, of, you know, of course there are a lot of very, very wealthy people out there who probably don't have those morning routines, but they're miserable. Mm -hmm. You know, when I think of somebody successful, it's somebody mm -hmm. who has a healthy mind, body, spirit, you know, lives an abundant life financially, but also in their relationships. And I guarantee you that anyone who has that sort of balance has these sort of habits. Mm. <clears throat> That's a good distinction because we, we all meet successful, financially successful people who really relationally and um, in other ways, spiritually, they're, they're just not what we're aspiring to be. And it's always curious to me whether they're, how they attracted that money and that level of success in that respect. Because, you know, we talk about the law of attraction and being in the place where you're attracting what you want, you're attracting who you are. How, how, would you, how do you explain, when you look at some uber, um, you know, wealthy person, for example, who's just a pain in the ass to deal with and miserable as all that, I look at that and think, how has he attracted that? Is it just by pure brute force? How does someone do that when the rest of their life's, you know, corrupted for all intents and purposes? Yeah, I mean, I think that how did they do it? I mean, they probably screwed a lot of people over along the way, you know, mm -hmm. and, and they got they got paid. And and you know, that's one way to do it, but it's like, can you sleep at night? How's your relationship with your wife? How's your relationship with your kids? Can you look at yourself in the mirror every day? You know. To me, there's so much more to just money. It's like mm -hmm. living a, a beautiful life and, um, you know, being grateful for all that you have. And, you know, you can have it all, but, it, you know, you just, you, you, you don't show up like an asshole. I'd rather make less money and be a good person. You know what I mean? Um, yep. I'm a firm believer in... Um, treating people right, doing the right thing and, and all that. And I actually think that 
if you stay that course mm -hmm. in the long run, you know, even financially, I'll argue, you can make more money than those shrewd businessmen because mm -hmm. at some point, you know, you've got to think that um, karma or whatever you believe in is, is going to mm -hmm. come back, come back to them. So it's about creation, isn't it? That's what I believe. You know, we're all creating it, whether the miserable millionaire he's created his life or whether the, um, you know, he's, he, you know, by short changing, by ripping people off, that shows up in his life in other, uh, other aspects. Do you see that, um, do you find that um, you're really feeling like you can create the life you want in all its different respects? Yeah, I, I do. And I, I like where you're headed with this. And I think that, you know, it has to do with, I think you mentioned the law of attraction earlier and, mm. you know, consciously focusing on how you show up every day in your way of being, right. how the world is going to respond to you. So if I wake up in the morning and I say, today I'm going to be open, loving, generous, and, you know, free right mm. and what i'm gonna get from the world is you know i'm gonna get love i'm if i'm generous i'm gonna get abundance back to me and i think that we all know that feeling and in the best mm. the best way i can describe it is like sometimes when i'm i'm in a really good mood and you're walking down the street you ever notice that like people kind of look at you differently they're like mm. all of a sudden you're like making eye contact with people you're smiling at people. It's almost like you're in this whole new world. Mm -hmm. And it's because it starts with you. It's because you feel good about yourself. And mm -hmm. it's because you're showing up in a certain way. But you know, if yep. you're down, you're going to feel like everyone's like kind of like scowling at you on the street. You ever, you ever feel that way? For sure. For sure. I, I really do believe that the energy, like one of the things I have is I say, I'm responsible for the energy that I bring. So I know I've sent it in both directions. I come into an environment, maybe a closed environment where there's a small group of people. And if, I'm, if I've had something that I'm coming negative, well, I can bring the whole sense of that room down. I can bring their expectations down, the language down, the joy, everything else. I can just, I can just by walking in there, someone thinks, whoa, what's going on with him? And then before long, they've all followed. And, and, and conversely, man, if, I, if, it, if I'm feeling like I've just won the lotto, or I'm just feeling so pumped about the beauty of life or whatever's happened. I've had a win here and I go in that same environment. Everyone can be lifted by that. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And I mean, like when, when you talk about teams and leading teams, when you can show up powerfully like that and take and not take, but be responsible for, you know, the, the mindset of a group of people and lead them in that direction that is super powerful. And when you asked me earlier, you know, how can people start out um, mm -hmm. in this business? I think that showing up with that kind of attitude around the right people and enrolling mm -hmm. them in who you are and in, in that business, you know, they're going to want to work with you. People want to mm -hmm. work with positive, just like supportive, awesome people. And, yeah. and you'll just attract them to yourself and, and mm -hmm. grow. We talked um, uh, through COVID, I know we've talked about this previously, that a lot of people are changing their work practices, you know, maybe not going into the office full time. Um, and, and you mentioned about thinking about, hey, can I, is this an opportunity for me to change the way my week looks? But um, do you find that that would, if you can control that more, then I'm guessing, as I look at that, and I, I practice this as well, then you could really, every time you turn up to that group of people, you've got the time to really prepare yourself knowing that that interaction, whether that's a group of contractors on a job, whether it's staff in your office, you can, so every time, and someone's starting to think, every time this guy turns up, he's just so on point. I don't, I don't see him 40 hours a week like I used to, but yeah. every time he comes in, he is just on fire and he just does something for me. Is that, I think these are opportunities that are presenting. Do you think that's true? Totally. And I've never, I actually haven't heard it framed in that way. And I think that's brilliant. And I think that's what I'm experiencing. It's like throughout COVID because, you know, I, I have my time in the morning to nail down those habits like I was talking about. 
and then I'll go into the office, you know, maybe three or four times a week for just a couple hours. And I'm just like hitting it, like, and I'm on fire and I'm showing up as like this great leader. And it's a little bit harder to stretch that out over, you know, long days, five days a week. Um, So there's definitely something to be said about, you know, taking the time to really like build yourself up for these, these smaller moments where you can make a a bigger impact. And Mm -hmm. yeah, coming out of COVID, I would love to not go back to where I was, but maybe find some sort of middle ground where like I can play with um, the routines I've created at home, but still, you know, be there, show face and, and, and be a leader at the office too. Yeah. So do you find that as time goes by that, that way of being is just permeating the way you are for longer periods of time, like all day, for example, I've had a great day because everything, or um, is that what you're finding over time that it's becoming, you've started out with that mindset. I'm going to be that way, but before long you are that way. And it's, it's like you're that way more consistently for longer periods of time. Yeah, I think it gets easier, but I, I would be lying if I told you I didn't have a lot of setbacks. I think Mm -hmm. like, to show up that way requires a lot of maintenance and mm-hmm. it requires a lot of breakdowns because mm-hmm. you obviously know that, you know, without breaking down, you're never going to have that breakthrough that's going to get you to that next level. So, you know, I, I get in funks for a day or two at a time, just like everybody mm-hmm. else. But what I'm learning is, you know, how do you shift out of that? And I'm learning to shift quicker. So, you know, what, would have taken me a few days. Maybe I can, Mm -hmm. I can do in like a day. And then the next day I show up powerfully. Um, So yeah, but it overall, yeah, longer periods of time, but it requires a lot of maintenance and a lot of work. Yeah. I remember a few years ago, I was doing a a commercial property development for a guy who had a lot of commercial property. He was very successful and uh, he was having a problem with his, his hip and it'd been an ongoing problem. And, I was I'm, eventually I was trying and trying and trying to get through to him. I had to talk and get some decisions around a particular area. And he said, Oh, look, I'm sorry. I've just been after a day or two of chasing him. He said, sorry, I've just been, I've been feeling terrible. I've got this problem and I just feel depressed about it. And um, I said, well, that's fine. But you know, we've got to make some decisions about this. He said, yeah, okay. I'm talking to you. I'm not talking to anyone else in my organization. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, I'm not going to, he said, and this is the point. He said, I'm not going to show up, come into my office or be there where I'm anything but at a thousand percent, which is what he normally is, because he viewed that everyone's going to, he wanted to maintain a consistent way of being every time he showed up and he didn't want to allow himself or others to see him in a less than 1000%. And I thought, wow, that, you know, and I can imagine in the, someone working for him every time they see him, He's at that level and they think, oh, I haven't seen him for a couple of days. What, wonder what's going on. Next time he's back, he's at that same level. I thought that was a great, really quite wise and a great insightful way of leading people and being consistent in that way. I think that's great too. I, I would just err on the side of caution of putting too much pressure on yourself to look good mm. for other people. So that's in that, you know, when you do take those times off, you know, you're not living this kind of like really highs and lows. So mm-hmm. I, I think there's definitely something to be said about like knowing when to step into leadership and when to mm-hmm. kind of take a back seat, but like mm-hmm. not being too hard on yourself and judging yourself that if I'm not a thousand percent, I can't yeah. show up because right. a lot of time, I think, I think you had to give yourself a little a slack too, you know, we're all human. Sure. So tell me, and I know that you've uh, done some posts on this about the way in which being vulnerable and being authentic is actually an access to connect with people at a different level as well. That's kind of the counter to what we're talking about right now. Yes. So um, (laughs) probably heard this, but like most people think that vulnerability is weakness, especially for men, right? It's like a lot of us are brought up to uh, act Mm -hmm. tough and you know be the tough guy and all that Mm. stuff and um a lot of times that's just a mask and it's it's Mm. hiding our true selves from the world and you know authentically um 
you know, a lot of us are, are sensitive, you know, men are sensitive too, you know, and, and that's okay. And I think that when you're vulnerable and, and you allow people to, to see you who, for who you really are, that's when you connect with people. So, and then when you connect with people, that's when you form good relationships. And when you form good mm-hmm. relationships, you form trust. And when you form trust, you know, you, you can like accomplish great things when you, when mm-hmm. you trust people who you're working with and your relationships, all of that. So, um, yeah, vulnerability, it's, it's a weird feeling. It takes a lot mm-hmm. of getting used to. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's refreshing. It's real. Mm-hmm. And it, yeah, more people should be more vulnerable. Mm. I know that I've, I've had, uh, when I've uh, been that way in certain circumstances, women I know have said, oh, I just love it that you're so transparent. And so it connects there, great. But if, you're, if you have to front up to your contractor, maybe, a uh, tough guy who's there with all his gear and... Uh, and there's maybe a, an issue about money that uh, you know is going to be contentious and you're feeling like you're not at the top of your game. Is that the time to, how do you deal with that in to be consistent and be authentic of what's going on for you that day, but also realizing that, Hey, I don't want to give this guy much room where he feels like he can you know, sandwich me, crush me because um, sometimes those, those relationships, you've got the power, They've got the power and the leverage can vary, can't it, um, on different topics. How do you uh, build yeah, anything so, for so uh, not be screwed? Right. So I think that power in negotiation and vulnerability are not mutually exclusive. Mm. I think it's really hard to, to be both vulnerable and powerful, but I think it can be done. And I think mm-hmm. that, you know, just because you want your way in a negotiation with a general contractor who might be a little bit rough around the edges and you kind of mm. feel like you got to play hardball. Mm. I really think that like it's difficult, but there's an opportunity there for you to still really be authentic to who you are um, and get what you want. And I think that just being honest helps. I mean, I wouldn't, I don't, I'm overplaying hardball with my subs and stuff. I'm just like, I'm straight up with people. I'm very honest. If they're doing something that I don't think is right or is pissing me off, you know, I authentically tell them that it's not like I'm backing down. It's like I'm powerfully standing for, for what I believe in um, and, and stating my case and, and, you know, you know, vulnerability, you know, you know, doesn't come up too much for me on site, but uh, I'm trying to think of a time, you know, when it has, but, you know, like I said, I, I I think you can, you can be both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is, is this a mind trick we're playing when we talk about ways of being? um, I know that you can, you know, if, if I know that when there's times I've been in a funk and I've, I've gone away and I've just sent, you know, got sent it again, got back to my principles and my values then I really can change uh, my approach and, and I can be different in the next hour than I was then. Um, is that, do you use that kind of as a resetting technique at times when you've been, um, when you're maybe a bit off color? Yeah. So what I, I like to meditate when I'm off and just kind of like, I, I, sometimes when I meditate, I envision like garbage men in my head, just like throwing bags of trash out of my head. <laughs> So I'm just like, I, I start by just like clearing my head, taking some really deep breaths. And then I, I actually step into gratitude because like when things are going wrong, there's always a silver lining and there's always something that a blessing there or something that, that once was, I have to do this. No, no, no. You, you get to do this. You're blessed yeah. to do this. Um, and when I step into that after a nice little meditation, that's when I start to shift. And then the biggest thing for me to shift is focus on other people. So call, call a friend and ask them if they, if they need some support or, Mm -hmm. 
donate some, donate some money to charity or go do someone a favor, but like focus out when in doubt, focus out. That's what a coach once told me. That was his shift technique. And mm. I've been using that focus out. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Look, we could talk for on property. We could talk about this mindset and the ways of being for hours, you and I, and we do it, you know, we're in a group and we, it's, it's accountability is so cool. We didn't even talk much about accountability. I love that the the conversation went from real estate and and more into mindfulness because it really is like the backbone I think of, of success or or has been for me. So thanks for leading the conversation in that direction. Yeah. So do you, so in terms of, I know that you're running a level up group and you're, um, and that's a, that's a regular group people are committed to. But in terms of people contacting you, what's your social coordinates? So yes, website, thank, et thank you. So my email is Gaetano, G-A-E-T-A-N-O, at levelupboss, L-E-V-E-L-U-P-B-O-S dot com. Mm-hmm. You can check out Level Up at levelupboss.com. My Instagram is real estate boss with one S and uh, yeah, please reach out, check out the website. It's a, uh, it's a really, it's a really great tool for anyone who's trying to um, surround themselves with a support system uh, specifically around real estate and get to the, get to the next level. Okay. I know that you're, you're one man and you're you, the, the level up program. You're keeping it specifically to a core group, but um and just following you, are you posting stuff regularly on Instagram that could, so if someone says, oh man, inspiring guy, uh, maybe there's not an opportunity to get involved in level up as such at the moment, because I know you, you put that in blocks of time throughout the year, but um, can they get, can they feed off these topics we're talking about through your Instagram? I, I, this is my way of encouraging you to put, keep putting more stuff out there, man, because yeah. every time I see a post from a guy, it's well, it's constructed and it's, it's thought about um, and it's, it's valuable. Thank you. Um, yes, I do put out content on the Instagram. You can check it out. There's some really great, like motivating quotes from some of my favorite leaders that I post. And, you know, it's my goal to, to really turn up the volume on the social media with level up over the next six months. So give me a follow and stay tuned. Yeah. There'll be a lot of value coming your way. That's awesome. That's a great way to end it. But can you just end it, end it by just telling me again your vision statement? Because I think that's so, so okay. awesome. Okay. Yeah. So um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, my vision is to build and lead teams of entrepreneurs committed to enriching their lives and unleashing their greatness on the world. That's awesome. That's really inspiring and challenging and inspiring. Thank you for that. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. Cool, man. Thank you for the time. It's great. All right. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.